Kicking off the list at number 10, skincare routines. For a long time now, having pale skin in Europe meant that you were among the wealthy because in the 17th and 18th century, this suggested you can enjoy the indoors. You didn't get sunburns working outside all day, AKA wealth. Keep in mind, this was long before sunscreen was ever even a thing. So at the time, the best thing to wash your face with was something called chemical wash. That was a mighty wash. This thing packed a punch, that's for sure. This wash would ideally get rid of sunburns, pimples, ringworms, smallpox, scurf, or morphew. I don't even know what scurf is, but it sounds awful. I don't want it. And your skin afterwards would be pale and literally glowing. Thing is, all these foundations were made with old timey, horrible, poisonous recipes. One of these facial creams, I swear, I'm not making it up, was literally this. Steep the lead in a pot of vinegar and rest it in a bed of horse manure for at least three weeks. What? I'm trying to get rid of bags under my eyes. How am I supposed to steep lead? What am I, Walter White? I don't know how to steep lead. I can barely steep tea, let alone lead. Moving on, I'm upset. Number nine, natural or painted. Today, the internet is full of makeup tutorials in every corner. Doesn't matter what style you're looking for, help is now available. You can learn how to draw on eyebrows while listening to a true crime story. You know what I'm saying? It's perfect. The makeup game is crazy, but back in the 1800s, you only had two looks to choose from, really. You had the painted look or the natural look. Natural was light on the makeup, more of a paste look than anything, almost like you're a Victorian painting, you know? One of those? But to achieve the lighter look, Europeans would use actual paint, like paint paint. Just lead-based paint. And the most important part of applying this is that you can't smile. You can't even move at all. Any emotion will cause the paint to literally crack. Again, that's why all these paintings are so serious. Madame X, the portrait of Virginie Amélie Avegno Goutreau, originally painted back in 1884. At first, Sargent made the woman's strap slipping off her shoulder. That was a little, you know, scandalous, a little oopsies. That was deemed too scandalous for the upper class society around him back in the 1800s. So John had to literally repaint these straps back on. Yeah, backlash was so strong, John had to move after he sold the painting. Guy left Paris because of spaghetti straps. What a nightmare. But this is what I'm talking about. You start drawing veins on pale skin, people would lose their mind. Love that pale veininess. Number eight, beauty patches. 1800s beauty patches came in many different shapes and sizes. Take this portrait from 1755, for example. Joshua Reynolds painted Charles the Ninth, Lord Cathcart, rocking a pretty large beauty patch. The guy literally looks like the rapper Nelly. That's massive, it looks like a band-aid on his cheek. Whereas other fabrics used in the 18th century were much smaller. They were tiny circles, hearts, stars. If you found this, you'd think somebody was gearing up to go to an Arctic Monkeys concert. They were often used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue. Now the patches were dark black to make the pale pop, but the location of where these went also had purpose. A beauty patch in the corner of your eye meant that you had a lot of passion. On the forehead, that was meant to be majestic, and a dimple patch, oh, well, you're a cheeky one. That's uh, the scandalous one you are. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took notes on these positions when observing two parties from the 1800s. One party had patches on the right side of their face and the other had the opposite. That's like switching jerseys back in the 1800s. You're like, ah, this team sucks. Number seven, mouse skin eyebrows. Okay, Stuart Little, if you're watching this, skip to number six. You don't wanna see any of this, all right? Trust me, it's not good. Back in the 1800s, as I mentioned earlier, the cosmetic game was harsh, to say the least. The eyebrows too, they had a rough go. Eyebrows were completely plucked off back then in order to make the forehead bigger. Yeah, you need that 1800s five head. That's the trick, apparently. Imagine if I shaved my eyebrows off and then painted my face like pale white. Honestly, I do it for the clicks. I do it for you guys. This five head look didn't last forever, thankfully, but for a hot minute, it almost got worse. In the late 17th century and early 18th century, these leading ladies would shave off their eyebrows and then they would glue on mouse skin to replace them. Like a band-aid, only horrible and stinky. Since their face was freshly painted and the glue game was weak, they would have one shot only to stick these puppies on. You just gotta eyeball it and hope that it works and that it looks in the right spot. I don't know. You put them on too low, you're gonna look upset all day long. Eyebrows are angry sisters, not angry twins, okay? Remember that. Number six, lip paint. Red lips always lie, especially when you don't know that ammonia is mixed in with it. How jolly. 
Back in the Victorian era, the pale look, red lips, beauty marks, you were trying to look like a literal queen. That was the whole point. So women in the 1800s would either make their own compound themselves, which didn't work, obviously, or if they had some money, they would buy some. The main ingredient in these days were not ideal. Crushed up insects, which already could cause allergic reactions when applied to your lips, but the ammonia mixed in really put the nail in the coffin at that point. Ammonia and crushed bugs? What am I, oogie boogie? What am I making here? What am I plotting? Number five, rationing legs. World War II was a war fought everywhere, and that includes at home. Go ahead and ask your grandparents what it was like. It was only a nickel for a bus ticket, and the movies had newsreels, yes. It's three o'clock and I'm ready for dinner. See, that's what they say. Go ahead and ask them, they'll tell you. Well, okay, Grandma. But on a serious note, people had to ration food for the war effort. They also had to ration other goods that you might not expect, like ladies' nylon stockings. In Britain, nylon stockings were all the rage, but the materials for such were needed for the war effort. So the Gravy Browning Company came up with a bright idea, just paint your stockings on. Some women actually did this, and sometimes would even draw on the seam with an eyebrow pencil just to make it look like the real thing. Ooh. However, I just cannot see this being a great idea. I mean, it rains a lot in Britain. Would it not just wash off? What if I get sweaty running for my bus because I'm late for work? Yup, this is another one I'm just gonna have to pass up on. I'm sure the pain was 100% safe for body application as well. It probably wasn't. Number four, bad hair days. All right, this one is generalizing, but hear me out. When was the last time you thought about haircuts in the past? Yeah, see, you don't. That's because they belong in the past. I'm talking about popular hairstyles from the 1950s to 2000s because honestly, there was a lot of them. And honestly, what were we thinking? We are a species that has left our own planet through science and technology. Yet, we come up with hairstyles like the beehive, the mullet, everything in the 1980s, and the most heinous, atrocious hairstyle ever, frosted tips. Sorry, Guy Fieri. The list goes on, but my point is people fully went out in public with these crazy hairstyles. I, myself, may or may not have sinned and maybe had frosted tips at one point in my life. I maybe had a button up shirt with a blue hot rod flames on it, but I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you the complete truth. After being a part of this trend, I can firmly say I no longer want to participate in any more bad hair days or blue flamed shirts. Number three, you do what with my wee? Back to the Romans again, and back to the pee. At least the Incas were keeping it outside the body. I, I guess Romans wanted a clean mouth and there wasn't any minty fresh mouthwash to reach for. So what do you use? We. Lots of we, specifically Portuguese we. It was just the most sought after. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I feel like there was more wine drinking than water drinking in Rome, more than people would like to admit it. So, if that is the byproduct of all that wine drinking and you're giving that a swish in your mouth, well, all I can say is I'm just gonna give that a big pass on playing spin the bottle. Number two, my little weight loss friend. Okay, I get it. It makes perfect sense. The numbers add up here. But all I'm gonna say is, the chief knows medicine and he said this is a hard pass for me and it ain't it. If you want to shed that extra winter weight and be beach body ready with minimal effort and still enjoy deep fried chocolate bars, then you have only one thing to do and that is swallow tapeworms. Where a tapeworm will grow inside your body and help eat those unwanted calories. Trouble is you can get very sick and if the tapeworm attaches itself to something that is, well, vital for your living, you're going to have a bad time. You'll get sick. Just don't do this one, please. Don't swallow tapeworms, please. Don't do it. Number one, I spy some great complexion. Arsenic cookies. I'm just gonna be blunt with this one. Women were eating arsenic cookies for their complexion. You could straight up just walk into a Sears in 1902 and just buy some. It says it's safe on the box. For people who aren't familiar with arsenic, it's poison. Spies often carry one in pill form to unalive themselves in case of capture. At this time in history, it was no secret what arsenic was. This is just kind of weird, like putting ketchup on your eggs, kind of weird. That's just a joke. We're having a debate here in the office and I'm just curious to see who does that. But back to the poison. It was not safe and over time, with lots of exposure, you can get very sick. It's arsenic, it's poison. Don't do that one either. Why, that's just wrong. Oh man. 
Getting us started at number 10 is top hats. A top hat is an iconic image. You can see them in old black and white movies or on logos such as Mr. Peanut. But why were top hats created and why were they so trendy? Well, there's multiple reasons actually. Men and women were already wearing hats and bonnets to protect their heads from rain, wind, and the soot from local smokestacks. As a result, hats were already quite a trendy wear. However, the true reason for its popularity is what it represented. The top hat quickly became symbolic of status, power, and masculinity. From 1850 to 1900, men wore top hats for business, pleasure, and formal occasions. Certain colors were even associated with certain times of day. For example, a black top hat was for day or night, making its wear feel taller, more handsome, even suave. Some were even reported to be a height of 12 to 14 inches tall. Top hats, amongst other hats of this era, also required ridiculous upkeep, such as being brushed, boiled regularly, powdered, etc. They also tend to contain mercury poison. As time progressed, we found other ways to overcompensate as well as accessorize our heads, so it's easier to see why the top hat never made a comeback. Number 9 in the countdown is women and their flirty fans. When you see a gentleman caller across the room, you may want to send him a hint that you're picking up the vibe that his top hat is putting out. What better way than subliminal messaging with an item you're already carrying? In Victorian times, women carried fans due to fainting spells, which were really just the result of their excessively tight and heavy garments, something we'll cover later in the video. In 1827, a fan maker from Paris, Double Roy, published a leaflet explaining the language behind the uses of a fan. Some examples were twirling the fan in the right hand meant that I love another. Meanwhile, drawing the fan across the cheek told someone special that I love you. A fan half opened and pressed to the lips gave permission for a kiss. However, it is rumored that the less romantic truth is that the fan etiquette, such as Duval Roy's leaflet, was invented in order to boost the sales of fans in the 19th century after they had fallen out of fashion following the French Revolution. Irregardless of rumors, it appears in olden times some people were using fans to get hot rather than cool down. Speaking of keeping it cool, next in our countdown at number 8 is bottomless underwear. While showing a bit of ankle may have made you a harlot, in the Victorian era every woman was walking around with crotchless undergarments. But these strange underoos were invented with a justified purpose. Due to the amount of fabric layers, steel crinolines, and tight bodices and dresses, women of the era didn't really have time to spend an hour undressing before nature calls. By creating undergarments that had holes aligned with the wearer's groin, a woman's only mission would be to hoist up as many layers as she could before popping a squat. Don't be fooled however, that wasn't exactly easy either. Some of you may wonder, what happened if Aunt Flo paid a visit while a woman was wearing an open bottom undergarment? Well, in Victorian times, menstruation hygiene was perceived very different and women quite literally let it flow. If you want to learn more, search that one up on your own. As fashion evolved and women wore fewer and lighter clothes in the early 20th century, pulling down undergarments from underneath bustles and cages was no longer a nightmare, so the crotchless undergarment was soon abandoned once more. But now it does make sense why everyone loved the high kicking can can dancers in 19th century Paris. Morning garb, and I don't mean pajamas, is number 7 in our countdown. Known as the monarch of mourning, Queen Victoria influenced how grieving women dressed and behaved in Europe and the United States after the passing of her husband in 1861. She famously mourned him for 40 years until her own demise and started what's now known as the Victorian mourning etiquette. Victorian mourning etiquette came with elaborate rituals to commemorate their dead. It became normal to have incredibly elaborate and lavish funerals, curtail social behavior, and even erect statues and ornate monuments as tombstones. Mourning clothes were part of this and they were introduced for both sexes. Set to show a family's outward display of their inner feelings after the passing of a loved one, the rules for who wore what and for how long were complicated and often outlined in popular journals or household manuals. Call that a mourner's magazine. Jokes aside, men definitely had it a lot easier. They simply wore their usual dark suits along with black gloves, hat bands, cravats, or ties. For women, especially should she be a widow, there were different levels of mourning and garb to wear as you progressed out of deep mourning and into lighter mourning and so forth. Deep mourning uh, was of course black, but also made specifically was a crepe styling, a scratchy silk with a 
puffed, crimped appearance associated with mourning as it doesn't pair with any other clothing. Right. The mourner would eventually stop donning the crepe and then stop donning black. This was called slightening the mourning before cloth colors eventually moved on to gray, mauve, then white until the mourning period was considered complete. Number six in our countdown is the human hair wearers. Fun because it rhymes, but creepy for a whole slew of reasons. So, what do I mean by human hair wearers? Well, it was a tradition in Victorian era to don jewelry that had segments of human hair embossed, woven, or sealed into it. But for many Victorian people, the amount of hair involved in remembering loved ones went far beyond a little lock in a necklace. In stores and women's magazines, you could find patterns for wreaths made of hair and wire, often floral designs. Bracelets, brooches, earrings, and necklaces were also all very common. In its prime, human hair, jewelry, and decor was considered incredibly fashionable. It's even said that swapping locks of hair was a love token between women loving women or friends the way that girls today might wear friendship bracelets with each other. I guess if you need a trim and you were already late on a birthday gift, you could really just kill two birds with one stone. Number five, a whole lot of man. Well, folks, I haven't done much traveling in my time, but it looks like I know where I'm headed next to the body tribes of Ethiopia, where, ladies and gentlemen, it's men of my proportions that are most attractive. <laughs> the men of the Bodhi tribe participate in beauty pageants of sorts, where the winner is declared a hero, and every girl in the village wants to be with the rotund hero. The men isolate themselves away for months at a time with no physical activity. Honestly, for a World of Warcraft player, isn't that hard? Where the men consume a diet that's high in fat to, well, make them fat. What's on the menu? I'm so glad you asked. Well, since the Bodhi tribe has such a great grasp on agriculture, the men drink cow's milk mixed with blood. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. After enough consuming of the milkshake from hell, the men's stomachs get fat and the gawking commences. I'm more than just a cut of meat, ladies. You can't just treat me that way. Number four, shark girls. All right, when I was researching this one, I could barely even look at the footage. I was literally cringing in my chair. And this is coming from a guy who likes the Star Wars prequels. Yeah, I know. There are certain women of tribes around the world who have teeth like jaws that are considered beautiful. And I mean the shark, not the James Bond villain. The process of sharpening teeth is quite, uh, well, interesting to say the least, as it's performed by dentists, and I would hardly call them dentists, as they use rocks and chisels to acquire this acquired look. Did I mention there's no anesthesia for this cosmetic surgery? All jokes aside, this is just a lot, and I actually get lightheaded just thinking about it. We gotta move on to the next point before I lose my lunch, or I pass out. Uh. Number three, the George Costanza. Today, every girl wants those long, luscious locks. No split ends with healthy hair and just a radiant glow. But women in ye olde Europe were after the chrome dome kind of look, if you know what I'm saying. They had their hair pulled back, revealing a large portion of their forehead. Hey, look, ladies, not that there's anything wrong with balding. It happens. I'd be very ignorant to say that it might happen to me too. It could. When I get old, it'll probably happen. I actually know a guy who's balding right now. Shout out to him. It's just strange how something that could be considered not beautiful today was all the rage back then. Queens literally sat down on their chairs and said, Give me the George Costanza look, please. I'm feeling like a real winner today, Jerry. Number two, burn it off. In ye olde times, medicine wasn't great. That's no secret. And sometimes these trendy medical practices crossed over into beauty. What do I mean by that? Well, nobody's perfect, right? We've all got bumps, bruises, blemishes, zits, pimples, scars, moles, spots, freckles, skin tags, eye bags, boils, bunions, warts, dark spots, and some emotional damage that a therapist or a bottle of vodka could not fix. However, when people in the oldie times needed to remove any of the lists I just mentioned, besides the internal suffering that is chronic depression and anxiety, they use hot pokers. No, that's not medicine, but rather the same kind of hot poker that you put in a fire. They were used to burn whatever it was that, well, needed to be burned off. Yes, burned off. While still a medical practice, imagine how beautiful you would feel after your least favorite spot got burned off in excruciating pain and probably causing an infection. Are you ready? Here it comes. I'm gonna do it twice in this list, but I'll let you guys finish it. Are you ready? I spoke to the chief and he said, it's not it. There you go. Hey, you said it. Let's go. Number one, glowing teeth. Teeth are important, and this is a reminder that you should go to the dentist. Stop putting it off, seriously. Healthy mouth is gorgeous for everyone. So that's why you'd want to use Doramand, a radioactive toothpaste. A what? Yes, a radioactive toothpaste, coming full circle with the radiation today. This stuff was what it said on the box. 
And this one literally did say it on the box. It was radioactive toothpaste. Like that was something to brag about or something. I don't need to tell you why that's wrong or unhealthy. You may as well just sit in a room and leave an x-ray machine on all day at that rate. Only minty fresh toothpaste for me, please. And coming in at number 10, stiff collars. This early 1900s invention was accidental by nature, but seems absolutely painful just hearing about it. The detachable collar or stiff collar, created by Hannah Montague in New York in 1827, has been coined the father killer. <gasps> but why? Well, this stiff detachable collar is so stiff that men could die from just wearing it. Yeah, basically just rubbing your jugular up against it all day would restrict oxygen to the brain. You could pass out or even die. This man was killed by a collar. So basically your own collar is rear naked choking the shit out of you all day. I thought the tie was the worst part. Made out of usually a separate material to the shirt pinned onto, the removable starch to absolute hell and back collar basically turns as a sharp and rigid on your neck as a knife. Pain is beauty, darling. Apparently men would fall asleep after a couple of drinks or succumb to a cat nap and sometimes not even wake up at all. Dressed to death. Literally. Number nine, mini bowler hats. Ah yes, are you tired of bowler hats fitting on your head properly? Are you stuck in the 1940s and you're now tired of regular sized, properly fitting bowler hats? Well, fear not, old heads. Introducing mini bowler hats. Yep, that right there, that right there is fashion. Right there, folks. Take something that's already working and then just jazz it up. You know, just mess it up just a little bit. This look didn't last too long because only a few could pull it off, obviously. The hat wouldn't fit on your head. That was the whole point. A hat that isn't supposed to fit. It was always sideways and like dainty. It was kind of half off. Any swift breeze comes along, good game. The hat's gone. Now you're chasing a mini bowler hat down the road like it's a silent film. Whoa, <laughs> oops, sorry, my hat. Harper's Bazaar deemed the mini bowler hat one of the worst of the 1940s. Yeah, I see a lot of hats now that aren't on all the way. Drives me nuts, I just wanna, just wanna put it on. It's always like about to flap off. I'm like, you're gonna lose it, man. The wind's gonna come, you're gonna lose that hat. It's a nice hat. Number eight, bad teeth. If you've had a couple root canals like me and enjoy the taste and feel of your tongue ripped to shreds after a big old bag of sours, well, then this one's for you. Opposed to the nice, clean, white smile we all strive for today, back then the sight of bad teeth was actually, well, charming. It usually meant you had a lot of money. Ah, those disgusting peasants and their hygiene. <laughs> teeth have a lifespan on their own, and the white discoloration from poor hygiene happens to all of us on its own. But the best method and the fastest method to ensure that those little chompers become stinky and brown, sugar. Which, if you were living anywhere between the 12th and 19th century, was very expensive and really hard to come by. So why the fashion craze? Well, it's got multiple purposes. For instance, in Southeast Asian cultures, blackening one's teeth or the Japanese oha guro was seen as both a beauty standard and a tooth preserver. This process would happen by coating the teeth in a mixture of goop, usually made out of iron, vinegar, and vegetable tannin to dye the teeth black. Queen Elizabeth is a great example of this beauty standard. She would basically just smash a sugar goop into her mouth every day to purposely destroy her teeth. The more infected and discolored the teeth, the better. Ew. Number seven, propeller hats. Okay, I'm coming for hats in this video, it seems. Sorry about that. Propeller hats in Super Mario, very practical. A lot of Goombas, sudden gusts of wind, plus a few warp pipes. You're gonna need a lift or two, right? Fair. The summer of 1947, not that windy, not that windy folks. Not windy enough for propeller hats, I'll tell you that for free. Why are teens in the 40s wearing airport runway anemone eaters on their heads? Why, we don't need to know the wind velocity outside, just go eat some ice cream. Well, it started with a cartoonist named Ray Faraday Nelson. See, he used this propeller hat in a cartoon, and then later on at a sci-fi convention, he had the cartoon there with a real life propeller hat. And everyone was like, what, well, how? How did he just do that? This of course swept the nation just like the fidget spinner. Brands made their own versions, they hopped on the trend quickly. So quick in fact that Nelson never had time to even secure a patent for this new fresh idea. Yeah, it was too late. He didn't get a dime from the hats and we didn't get the gift of solo flight. So let's call it even, Ray. Number six, ruffs. With silken coats and caps and golden rings, with ruffs and cuffs and farthingales and things. Taming of the Shrew, Act 4, Scene 3. Ah oh, yes, the theater and the rough. Well, not that rough, but quite literally theater in a rough. 
A ruff, I sound like a dog. A ruff, or also known as the Elizabethan collar, was an interchangeable piece of cloth that could itself be laundered separately while keeping the wearer's gown from not being soiled at the neckline. Long story short, no Chef Boyardee spilling out of your mouth and down onto your clothes. <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. The stiffness of the garment forced upright posture and poise. Most ruffs could only be worn once due to its longevity and structure. Made out of a very fine material like silk, their light and delicate material, design and size led them to become a symbol of wealth and status amongst the upper class. There was even a time where blue dyed ruffs were against the law in England since it resembled Scotland's colours on its flag. It shall only be of two primary colours, yellow and blood. Oh, red. Red? Red! At number 5, Long Skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times at least was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. At number 4, Five Head. Let's go back to the renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion. I suppose. At number 3, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that, and you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. At number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waist. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no-no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, I have my ears pierced, and obviously my nose is pierced, but there are so many other places that you can get pierced even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together, and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants more comfortable. 
This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. Oh boy, was she right. Number 10, golden hair. Hair is important. Imagine how different George Clooney would look if he was balding. Ooh. You gotta take care of your hair. There's nothing like treating your scalp to a nice scented and moisturizing shampoo. The Incas thought this too. And reach for the next best thing. Fermented pee. Oh yes, that's right. Basically, you take a pot, you put some wee in it, and let it sit for a week. Why not? Want to stay smelling fresh, of course. I'm not sure if this would make your hair silky smooth, as I'm not frankly in the market to try this. And this one, I can firmly say that if you try this one at home, stop it. Get some help. Don't do that. We belongs in the toilet, not on top of your head. Stop. Number nine, what a crock. As if urine in the hair wasn't enough, this beauty trend comes at you from the Romans and the Greeks. The Romans and the Greeks were the peak of ancient civilizations, built beautiful monuments, and were honestly just so smart, so smart. So smart that when they saw crocodile dung, they knew right away it had some beauty properties that they just couldn't pass up. They would bathe in crocodile dung. That's right, bathe in crocodile dung. Known for its restorative and anti-aging properties, I'm just not sure how this works really. Did they like heat it up or something or did this like slip into a tub with a pile of like lukewarm unlawfulness? And how do they really know it had de-aging properties? I'm starting to think this knowledge might be related to the whole urine shampoo thing. This is also gonna be a hard pass for me, no thanks, I'm, I'm good, no, no, no poo in the hair. Number eight. Beauty is pain. Ladies, we all know sometimes beauty is pain. It can be a lot or even too much sometimes, but how far are you willing to go for a little extra beauty? In ye olde times, pale skin was considered to be beautiful, but not always the easiest to obtain. Makeup is expensive and was made of lead and other lovely materials. With all that makeup being caked on, that had to feel lovely on your face. So what's the next best thing? Bloodletting, yes, that's right. In order to have that healthy twilight pale look, women found themselves relieving themselves of their blood. Bloodletting was used for other medical reasons at the time as well, but why not get two birds stoned at once? Stay healthy and achieve that beautiful complexion. I unfortunately pass out at the sight of someone else's blood, so the loss of my own just to be pale would not, would not bode well for me. I will have to hard pass on this trend as well. Plus, look at these rosy cheeks. I don't want to lose that. I think it makes me look cute. Number seven, mice flavored toothpaste. It's ancient Egypt. Life is great. You got the pyramids. You got the Nile River. And you got some guy who claims to be a doctor and he's pulling out the brains of your last king through his nose so he can be mummified for the afterlife. That's just awesome. Just another day under Ra's warm sand. Egyptians just knew how to live and they knew dental hygiene was important. So they came up with toothpaste. Sore tooth? Try this toothpaste. What was this toothpaste made of, you ask? Well, it was made of crushed mice, of course. Oh, God. I mean, here I am thinking that just some herbs crushed up with some water would be fine to eliminate bad breath, but after all, having nice teeth and nice breath is sexy. So, the Egyptians took some mice and they crushed them up with other ingredients in what must have been the most foul and rancid concoction this side of the Nile River. Just go ahead, put that goop in your mouth. You'll look okay, you'll look great after. Oh, just brush it on there, smells great. Oh, that's amazing. Number six, pearly blacks. Here's another beauty trend brought to you by the horrifying things we as human beings can do to a mouth. In Japan, there's a practice called ohaguro, which just translates to blackening of teeth. Japanese women would essentially, over time, dye their teeth black. Another dual purpose, as it was thought to preserve teeth in old age, and was seen as a sign of beauty. Something that separates humans from beasts, or so they thought. The dye itself was similar to some inks, as the process involved dissolving iron, vinegar, and some oils. After this process, a concoction is made that is a non-water soluble and acts like a dye when applied to the teeth. Yet again, as a semi-charming internet host, I am going to pass on this opportunity. Plus, who am I to judge? Japan has given us lots of fun stuff, lots of great stuff. They're awesome. 
Mario, Zelda, Little Mac. Basically, I'm a Nintendo nerd, so I can never speak ill of the land of my favorite games. Even if the whole black teeth thing only ended like 150 years ago, which, when you think about it, isn't that long ago. Number five, Bliats. Heading back to the 12th century for this gem. European men and women both rock this look, okay? Of course, sleeves that droop down all the way to the floor. Who wouldn't want a piece of that action? Walking around all slow like this for no reason? We've seen Lord of the Rings. Imagine walking around in a castle with one of these playfully just dragging behind you as you emerge from the cellar on a full moon night. Oh, my majesty. I'm gonna faint thinking about it. That's easy. Man, we need Bliats back today. I wish I had a couple Bliats for prom. Wouldn't have even had to ask her to dance. I would just stick my Bliats out and then a queen would accompany me. Just like that, voila. The roots for this dazzling look go back to the French Germanic origins. The word translates to our modern day use of blouse because it was the same light, ghosty, material. Yeah, imagine attending a meeting in a bliot blouse made of silk. Immediate write-up. So fast. Number four, the bikini. I don't know why, but for some reason in every picture as a kid, I'm running around in a sexy black speedo. <laughs> you know the deal. No shorts, just thong on cheeks. I was always embarrassed by the lack of clothing and felt vulnerable, but learned growing up that that's fashion, baby. Sometimes you feel a little uncomfortable. The bikini, a controversial and even at many times illegal piece of clothing, is a piece of fashion that has been around as early as 56 600 BC, and the history of the bikini can be traced back to that era. Carvings and paintings of women wearing bikini-like garments during the competitive athletic events in Rome have been found in several locations. Most of the time worn by women, the bikini went through a ton of design. Two-piece bathing suits have been seen all over the world, so what's the problem? Well, it's illegal in certain places and illegal now, still. Inappropriate use of showing off one's body could be a crime around the early 1900s. Police would just walk around the beach and measure the length of a two-piece bathing suit. <laughs> You have the right to remain silent, anything you do or say. The 30s and the 40s, it's still pretty exotic and people were kind of shady about the idea of revealing so much skin. The 40s and the 50s comes around, starts to become a little bit more Hollywoodized, and then the 60s and 70s, it's on every magazine in America. The two-piece bikini is worn today and is a symbol of confidence and sexuality. How much do you think they go for? Number three, moon boots. Unless you're Link from the past and or future, you're not pulling off a pair of moon boots, okay? Sorry to burst your bubble. Back in the late 60s, these hot and heavy pieces of footwear were the hottest trend in town for some reason. Yeah, winter boots all year round. We love it. Fashion. But yeah, welcome to Canada. Also, we wear these 11 months out of the year. It sucks. My ankles are always hurting. Moon boots originally appeared in 1969 in Italy, and it was part of a ski wear collection, but add a little Apollo 11 moon landing into the mix, now we have a fashion trend in history. Now we all think we're astronauts and we're dragging our feet to the club in the middle of July. Once space became old news, so did the Apollo boots, sadly. We've seen these bad boys appear in modern history, Chanel, Jeremy Scott. Big names are still trying, trying to bring back the moon boots. Let's bring back the moon shoes, how about that? How about a functioning pair of those? Remember the commercial? Kid jumps, grabs an apple, lands. Just false advertising at its best. Number two, high heels. The high heeled shoe or high heels or simply known as where's my heel have been a piece of fashion since the early 10th century. The design raises the heel of the wearer's foot significantly higher off the ground than the wearer's toes causing the wearer's legs to appear longer, make the wearer appeal taller, and accentuate muscle tones in the wearer's legs. It's all about the calves nowadays, man, all about the calves. Typically seen as a men's garment until the mid 1500s, the high heel is a staple in today's fashion as its design and functionality hasn't changed in almost a thousand years. King Louis XIV of France made heels a standard and would have himself hundreds of pairs of gemstones, lavishly precious metal lined high heels, basically just one of the Kardashians closets. But as we all know, pain is beauty and these nasty things really up your feet. Due to the structure of the high heel, this piece of fashion could be the most harmful to our bodies. Just shoving your size eights in a sexy size five crumpled up like Play-Doh all night? Yeah, that's uh, definitely gonna do it. And finally, number one, painted veins. Hey, from one pale human being to another, I have no idea where this came from. I, I don't get it. I don't see it at all, really. Back in the 1800s, you only had two looks to choose from, really. There was painted or natural. See, natural was light on the makeup, as you'd guess by its name, but painted, well, they meant that in a literal sense. This more vibrant look required actual paint, just lead-based paint. And the most important part of applying all this is you can't move or smile. Yeah, any emotion will cause the paint to crack. That's why all these paintings are so serious. Four more hours? Four hours? Okay. Madam X, the portrait, the famous portrait, originally painted back in 1884. At first, her straps were slipping off her shoulder, right? A little... Right? But that was deemed too scandalous for the upper class society around the painting at that time, so John had to repaint the straps back on. 
What a joke. He's like, okay, too sexy? Okay, straps are on. There we go, we're fixed. Backlash was still so strong after John had sold the painting because her skin was so pale and you could see her veins. It was like, oh, too much. I can see through you, what the hell? Just no winning back in the 1800s, eh? Can't have spaghetti straps, can't have veins. Wait till Playboy comes out. You guys are gonna sh it. Number 10, face off. All right, so it's the 1900s, and technology has gotten good since the 1800s. That means a better life for everyone to enjoy. One such advancement was in women's cosmetics. Introducing the Radia, a brand of makeup that's formulated to make you glow, ladies. And if you don't glow, you can't shine. The secret ingredient? Radioactive materials. I honestly can't believe that this one is real, but yep, here I am. Yes, their makeup products contain concentrations of radioactive material to give you the facial boost that you need, tighten the skin, get rid of wrinkles, and literally make you glow. I'm not a doctor, and you probably aren't one either, but I don't think I have to tell you that applying nuclear material to your face every day before work is not a great idea. In fact, it might be a speed running strategy to see how fast you can end up in a hospital for radioactive sickness. I read a report from the chief, who's a nuclear scientist, and he said that's not it. Number 9, Nail Biter. There's a short amount of time on the clock. The scores are tied and your favorite team's player steps up to the pitch, plate, or wherever they need to be. Beer sweats begin to drip down your face onto a jersey that should have been thrown out two playoffs ago. The nachos and chicken wings that were once plentiful on your coffee table now lay barren with emptiness. This is what most sports fans would call a nail biter. But all Super Bowl predictions aside, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in ye olde times, trimming their nails. How else but with the set of pearl chompers the Lord hath given you. That's just how people did it. Yes, that's right, they bit their nails off. Which even today is kind of gross. You gotta use the old noggin for a minute and think about how clean people's hands were. No running water, no modern toilet paper, Ooh, stinky. That is not a win-win situation. That is, that's actually a lose-lose situation. Don't do that, that's gross. Number eight, mini brows. Back in ye olde times, pale skin was in, and so was dark eyebrows. How to achieve such a complexion? Well, bloodletting for the skin, but I've gone over that before. Something a little more heinous was committed to make ladies' eyebrows look luscious. Mice, a lady's best friend, right? Yeah. Besides some French rouge and ivory teeth, a common beauty practice was to have mouse furs as eyebrows. This is just wrong on so many levels. Mice are just gross as it is on a regular basis without them being on your face. But my question is, was there like a mouse hunter or like, was there a mouse farm? Or was the buddy just scooping up mice out of the gutters and skinning them and then, uh, here you go, your highness, here's some fresh mice skins. Ooh, yuck, man, no. Number seven, pucker up. Hey, on this channel, we've talked about some crazy stuff in history, and a lot of crazy stuff unfortunately had a lot to do with women being hugely mistreated in the past. However, some women acted against this. I'd give specific reasons for wanting to get back at the patriarchy, but I'd be here all day. One woman came up with a devious plan, a way to remove the stinky men from her life and to get away with it too. Introducing Aqua Tofana. It was an odorless, colorless poison that was slow acting and would resemble side effects of a sickness, or at least a common sickness at the time. It was marketed as a cosmetic. Women could wear this on their cheek and when the big hunk of a man came in for a kiss, well, it was probably one of the last things he would ever do. The main ingredients were arsenic and nightshade, which, if you didn't know, is very poisonous. Next time you forget to take the trash out at night, gentlemen, just take notice of when the wife wants to give you a kiss. It could be your last. Number six, boots with the fur. Most of you probably love a good pair of apple bottom jeans and some boots with the fur. But for our Silver Fox audience, they may remember a pair of denim that was more sinister. Bell bottom jeans. Yes, that's right. These pants were wild to say the least. While its origins may be rooted in the Navy and sailors, their rise to fame was during the 60s and the white powder fueled 70s. Remember disco? I know, right? High platform shoes, bell bottoms, and leisure suits. Although I can't lie, I feel like I look pretty good in a leisure suit. Just saying, I don't know. This is just one of those beauty trends that we thought looked good, but in reality looked really strange. I'm sure that'll never happen again though. Not like the trends and fads that we have today will ever go out of style. We'll all be looking back and laughing at the silly things we wore, right? <laughs> oh man, I gotta clean up my closet. Are we still gonna be doing Fortnite dances then? I don't know, we'll see. Number five. 
Krakows. A popular shoe first originating in what is now Poland, the Krakow gets its name from exactly this place, Krakow. Or also known as Poulain shoes were worn from roughly the 13th century to the 17th century by men and women of all classes. Multi-sizable, the long pointed shoe would have been sewn to a point and just rounded at the tip. The first use of course was merely decorative, stuffed at the toes with usually moss or hay. As time went on the fashion trend took off and more and more people were just designing long stinky socks. Just 1420 muddy England with no arch support, slipping and sliding all over the streets. How bad did they smell too? No socks, just foot on shoe rubbing? And you know they weren't clipping those toenails. I bet they were just curled up underneath them. Ew. I guess these would have been good for all shoe sizes. Kind of like a one shoe fits all your whole life kind of deal. Typically made out of wool or leather, these could be also crafted into metal and fitted for a night. Like swords aren't scary enough. Now I gotta dodge your pointy knife boot attack? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Number four, powdered wigs. The powdered wig or periwig, most famously coined after Louis XIV started this up and coming trend. As far back as the 1600s, we've seen these paintings of men and women with huge white hairdos. You're thinking, that's a lot of hairspray and a lot of stress. Well, actually it wasn't even their hair. In fact, most men and women were balding underneath during these times. Yeah, syphilis, good one. Syphilis was the most popular of STDs and one of the common side effects was patchy balding hair also blisters, and also sores. With the plague constantly knocking on the door, cleanliness and class was upheld in values more than anything. The powder, consisting mostly of starch and lavender, was used to powder wigs and rid them of odors, stains, and even bugs? Dude, I'm getting itchy reading this. That's right, a ton of bugs, usually in the form of lice, would be attracted to these wigs and most of the time were infested even before their first wear. Worn by all classes, the powdered wig is an icon in fashion. It's used through so many centuries by so many different people, just coughing nonstop while shaving your head so you don't get fleas, shaking the ants out of your head before the big dance. <laughs> The common price for a decent wig would cost about a week's worth of wages. Of course, the upper class spending much higher price for larger and better quality pieces, coining the term big wigs. The rich and their bad hair pieces. Like it's jet black, you're 89, dude, let it go. Number three, chain mail. Worn from third century BC to about 16th century AD, historians point us in the direction of Celtics in Europe for the initial use and design of this shiny metal shirt. From the word burny, the chainmail is one of the most widely known lightweight mobile armors people could really wear for one's safety. One of the most useful and practical sets of wardrobe designed for mostly military personnel, the chainmail, or commonly known as mail, was a lattice grid consisting of tightly fitted metal loops to form an almost knitted poncho, hood, sleeve, you name it, they made it. This item of clothing would be custom fitted to your body and worn all day. I bet you'd be pretty tired because most of the time, a full jumper of mail was about 50 pounds in the rain and the mud. That's heavy. And in the rain too? Like, did they ever get electrocuted? You're basically a giant metal golf club on top of a castle fighting with sharper metal golf clubs. Zeus just chucking thunderbolts down at you and you're just trying to keep your head up. Number two, cod pieces. Jock, dance belt, the old stuff the sock trick. These guys did it first. And I say guys, cause guys, men definitely created this. Uh, yeah, I'll take the uh, bigger size. The, the, big, the big one, hurry up please, hurry up. Size mattered back then and size of one's cod mattered. A piece of fashion designed for both safety and for boasting. Getting dressed was hard back then and you didn't want to get your bits all caught up in any material. So the answer was the 15th century cod piece made out of metal, wood, or leather. The cod piece was fitted around a man's stuff and securely tied to his waist belt or pantalones, either under or over his clothes. Some believe this was designed due to the waistlines rising and the shortening of one's jacket over the years revealing more and more of the goods. Sometimes to show off, sometimes for battle, and much like the modern jock, it did serve numerous protection reasons, but was mostly seen at the time as a fashion statement. Again, size and reputation mattered, and flaunting was all part of the 15th, 16th century culture. Louis XIV knows what's up. And step bull change, sire. And number one, 
Macaroni. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it Macaroni. Yeah, that's a real song, dude. I thought my neighbor Declan made that up playing road hockey when I was eight. Near the end of the 18th century and one of Europe's most heightened times, also known as the Age of Enlightenment, was an eclectic group of people called the Macaronis. No, not the delicious noodle, but instead a group of young men flamboyantly pushing the boundaries of fashion to even trolling it. Huh. These men were mocking the style and in that created another style. Yeah, that's pretty gangster, dude. Basically, you would wear the biggest wig you had and on top, a tiny miniature hat and a feather. Just a cute little guy. Someone was definitely trying to make their friend laugh and then it just worked. This high slang term for high fashion is thought to have originated from the elegantly dressed Italian immigrants. Elegantly noted Italian men boasting about how perfect their macaroni pasta was and throwing about the term for everything they liked or adored as macaroni. Wow, I love your shoes, they're so macaroni. Yeah, your hair's like so macaroni. It's like really macaroni, you know what I mean? The sillier and more elegant and more vibrant, the better. Men would have to walk around with ceiling high wigs, the balance alone. Okay, okay, there we go. It was a time to show off. And the coolest part, macaroni style was genderless. Men and women could borrow and mix mash styles at this point in history and people were digging it. It was like the 80s of the century. Well, I guess that's literally the 80s at some point. Vibrant colors, glitz and glamor, you name it, they wore it. And that's why I feel the macaronis deserve the number one spot here. Just the name alone, man, come on. At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging necklines to show off the girls, and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this, they came up with a new beauty trend, drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible, and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number nine, tiny tea. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah. Teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know, because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the bell of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, nails for days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails, though, isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you can imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? 
At number seven, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful, and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. At number six, tiny tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was five or six years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. Number five. Cowboys and aliens. Here we go. Of course, wouldn't be a Taylor McWaters list if there wasn't any alien nonsense. Long before the Roswell incident in New Mexico, which we've talked about plenty of times here, aliens may have visited us before. Yeah, old cowboy stuff. This report came from 1896, when two men in California all reported that three alien beings were trying to abduct them. Yeah, it wasn't a sighting. They were trying to like, I'm like trying to grab them and pick them up. That's terrifying. He's like, take my hat. One of them was even a colonel. Colonel H.G. Shaw and Camille Spooner were both going from the town of Lodi to the Fresno Citrus Fair, which sounds like a wonderful time. Sounds like a great fair. But on route, they were greeted by seven foot tall, slender aliens. Apparently, that's pretty jarring. The aliens didn't end up taking the two men because, well, they were too heavy and well, one's a colonel, so he probably, you know, gave a nice left hook or something. But they said they fought off these aliens. That was their legit excuse why they didn't get abducted into outer space because two cowboys fought seven foot tall aliens. Do we buy it? I buy it. I don't know. Why would they make it up, right? They don't know what aliens look like. Nope wasn't out back then. They have no reason to lie. They're just bored going to a saloon for four days. Yeah, it's probably fake. I don't believe it. Number four, old true crime. If you're going to parody the wild, wild west, you need a horse, a hat, a big sack with a dollar sign on it, right? Wasn't it like Bandit Central back then? Weren't there bank robberies on every dusty corner and every dusty town? No, there wasn't at all. That wasn't actually a thing. This wasn't the town with Ben Affleck. That's not a thing that happened. Bank robberies didn't happen back then at all. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies in total. In total, that's it, eight. That many years, along 15 Western states, there were only eight. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were roughly 4,000 bank robberies in the United States, which is a bit more. Right? Just a little bit more. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by famous outlaw Jesse James and his brother Frank James. This went down in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. Yeah, they probably got like $14. They're like, woohoo, we're rich. Number three, kicked by a horse. Here we go. We've heard about this at some point. People are getting kicked off of horses or by horses, around horses, or bulls. That's crazy. I don't know how people run with bulls. But did it actually happen back then? Turns out getting kicked in the head by a horse back in the 1800s was like getting in a car accident today. If you have a horse, it's... The odds are significantly higher. It's probably gonna happen at some point in some way, shape, or form. Bill Pickett just sounds like a Western man already, doesn't it? Bill Pickett was born in the late 1870s and he invented the bulldogging practice, which, bear with me, sounds a little worse than it is. The practice is to jump from the back of a horse onto a wild steer. It's like, you know, 
I guess, cowboy stuff. There's many that attempted this move, this trick. I don't know, like a trick, like it's a skateboard trick. I don't know. Many attempted this and then they failed. Yeah, it's almost like you can't wrestle a wild animal and easily live to tell about it. Weird, right? I've read it, I've seen some things. But even Bill Pickett himself got trampled and stomped to death in 1932. Holbrook Lynn, a Broadway star from the late 1800s, also met their fate from a horse accident. Imagine that, it's headlines. Malcolm Baldrige Jr., an American politician from the late 80s, rodeo accident. Brutal way to go, these are wild. I did not know about a lot of these. There's so many. Look into them if you want. Such a grim list. Top 10 people that have been killed by a horse. I don't know, maybe, we'll see. Number two, business in the front and also the back. I love going to a pub, right? And right as the night begins to decline, a band always appears out of nowhere, right? You're like, yes, there we go. We have a band, now we're staying for nine more hours. Let's do it, we have a night. Good or bad, we love a band. Play Shout, I don't care. But bars back in the Wild West, not many bands. Wasn't so fun, not a lot of jazz going on in those saloons. Not a lot of open mics either in the 1800s. Turns out, that's uh, no fun. Back in the 1800s, these saloons were only for business. That was their sole purpose. You come in here, drink something awful, put that weird foot up and make a deal. The odd time, sure, you'd have poker, dice to be laying around, a piano perhaps. Maybe some jazzy fingers would make their way in and quickly leave, I don't know, but it wasn't common. When saloons first popped up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time, it was only reserved for lawmen, miners, and gamblers. That's it. So if you walk in thirsty, they're like, eh, gamble, I guess, I don't know. That's, you're gonna have to trick your way in here. And finally, number one, the gallows. We've mentioned the gallows many times on here before, especially on Bumblebee. It's almost like humans are consistently cruel and awful to others or something. Odd. But when it comes to meeting your fate in the Wild West, well, it sounds horrible to say, but with everything else that we've heard, at least being hanged was fast. Being kicked by a horse and whatever comes afterwards, probably not so quick. And in the case of Tom Blackjack Ketchum, it was a historical death. See, after a train robbery gone wrong, Tom Ketchum was held in prison until his date with the gallows arrived. But while waiting in prison, he gained weight. This guy was eating, he was eating good apparently. He weighed around 200 pounds by the time of his demise. And dark detail here, but his body was so heavy that when he was finally hanged, his head um, left his body, it kinda like, you know, it popped off his torso. It's disgusting, but we have to end on that. I can't go from a guy losing his head to like camels. You know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense. Number 10, the hobble skirt. This is a bad idea written all over it. The hobble skirt, also jokingly called the speed limit skirt, was a dress with a very tight hem, making the poor lass who's wearing its movement, well, not having much of it. Can't have the wife running off from her home now, <laughs> even if that, you know, that meant the home was not a good place and men acted really bad back then. But no, you can't have her running away. Apparently though, some were so tight that it caused women to fall. And in some extreme cases, I, I can't believe this, those falls were fatal. What? Number nine, muslin dresses. Honestly, I can see celebrities doing this today. Okay, so the female figure. It's sleek, it's curvy, it's gorgeous. Today a girl's got some options on how she wants to flaunt what her mama gave her. You go girls. But back then, well, not, not so much. Except for the muslin dress, apparently, which I find strange at the time, since seeing a woman's ankle could give a guy a stiff neck for hours, if you catch my drift. Essentially, this was a dress that you had to wet first, like a, a gentle misting, if you will. Yeah, weird, right? And then you'd wear it out. Now, for the summertime, this makes sense, and honestly, I might support this myself, actually. See the curves, stay cool. However, some stories tell us of women who wore this during cooler weather and then got sick. Fashion over function, ladies. Be careful. That's a silly one. Oh, 40 below, I better wear my muslin dress. Yes, I'm just gonna walk out. <laughs> Number eight, ladies wear. Okay, this is a general one, but ladies' dresses and wear in general was just ridiculous. I mean, I mean, those big poofy dresses, it just seems like ladies had it rough. When have they not? Wear a dress that's too tight or so big you struggle to walk around. Not to mention the fancies of dresses have wire, wood cages, and frames. Just making walking around more difficult because, yeah, that makes sense. For me, anytime I wear formal wear, I keep an eye out for bathrooms. You never know when you need to go. However, I just can't imagine trying to squeeze the lemon on those bad boys. Whew, that would be difficult. To make matters worse, there are stories of women wearing just regular big poopy dresses and then getting in accidents at factories. And yes, it was gruesome. And yes, they didn't make it out. And no, there's no movies about it. Stop asking. Number seven, pestilence fabrics. Last time I was talking about the Victorian era, I mentioned a few points on fabrics with harmful and dangerous chemicals, which happened more than it should have. 
shouldn't happen at all really, it's kind of sad. Well, that wasn't the only fabric related issue that was out to get you back then. For example, wealthy people couldn't be bothered to do their own laundry. I hate doing laundry, I don't blame you. I'm not wealthy though. And sometimes would have them washed and taken away by launders who, well, wash clothes in the rest of the city. Being that clothes and washers themselves were poor, or that clothes were just mixed around regardless, well, that was an issue. There was a lot of sickness going around at the time and, well, it was contagious. A lot of times these sicknesses would cling to fabrics and when given back to their customers, well, they could very well come down whatever London was feeling at the time. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I, I, I think I'll just wear more of my dirty stuff. I'll just wear my underwear for six months straight. It was white when I bought it. Not anymore, but it's okay. Number six, lead. Here we go again. Lead. Just lead in general. It was used in so much stuff. Seriously, it, it, it's scary. Especially because they knew it was harmful. It wasn't a secret. They knew. I was gonna pick one leaded item, but I, I mean, I couldn't. I mean, seriously, I know this is a list about fashion, but it was involved in some clothes making processes, it was, it was in women's makeup, which that's also fashion, and it was in house paint, which I know that's not technically fashion, but it kinda is. Trust me, I used to mix paint before I was an internet comedian. I know the history of paint. Ask me your paint related questions in the comments below. I'm the guy you need to talk to. I mean, it was used in pipes too, and we drank out of those, it's just crazy. Now, it is one of those things that minor exposure to is fine, sure, but the thing was with fashion and beauty is that you probably would use said product every day, like the clothing or the makeup, and especially the makeup of the ladies. Lead poisoning symptoms include headaches, stomach pain, constipation, infertility, and memory loss. Yikes, that's not fun. We don't like that here. Fine. Number five, corsets. I can't even imagine how hard it was to wear one of these. Like, I have no chest. I'm just a diving board. And already, this is a nightmare. I can't even imagine. The Victorian corset, okay. <gasps> Tiny waist, curves, look, the whole thing. Obviously, this was horrible for your body. Just looking at this, you're like, ugh. Your ribs would literally slowly deform, as well as your spine misaligning. But instead of talking about how horrible this obvious one was, let's talk about that corset duel from 1836. Yeah, have you heard about this? That's a real thing. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens. She had to marry her uncle when she was 20 back in the 1850s, so surprise, surprise, she was a little unhappy. Weird, right? So since the marriage began, her husband, he was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, whatever. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun in life. Then he's like, ugh, what are you doing? Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she defied convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess, to a duel and nothing but a corset. How badass is that? To this day, it's not yet determined who won, per se, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks? Yeah, that should be a musical. Forget Frozen. I wanna watch this on DVD, let's go. Number four, Deadly Nightshade. Macbeth's soldiers used Deadly Nightshade to poison their enemies. And during the Victorian age, women would apply Nightshade to their eyes, just so they look nice. Awesome, so this is horrible, let's talk about it. The pupils would become larger after this, okay? That was the whole point of putting poison in your eyeballs. The thing that makes Deadly Nightshade so commonly known is the sweetness of the berries. Have you ever been outside and you see a berry and like 30% of you really wants to eat that berry? Well, curiosity kills. Deadly Nightshade can be found in Europe, Asia, and Africa. It grows purple flowers in groups of three, along with those inviting purple berries. Just two to four berries can kill a human being, so don't, when in doubt, just don't eat them. And the flower as well, don't ingest this, you'll get poisoned. And also, don't put any near your eyeballs, in this century or the next. Number three, bustles. So while corsets are one nightmare, bustles are just an entirely new thing. Tiny waist wasn't enough, eh? Had to get big old dump trucks as well. These Victorian folks went hard in the paint, figuratively and literally, I guess. Bustles were also known as the Grecian bend. Big old booty bend, that's it. It came to town in the 1870s and it took the idea of wearing a cage as a skirt to just having the back part extend out. Ah yes, an update, an upgrade, I guess. Then the fabric was draped behind the butt. Hope you don't like sitting down ever, because that's obviously not an option. Corsets would move your organs around slowly and bustles would slowly damage your back. So let's leave this one in the 1800s. I think that's probably for the best. Number two, red lead redemption. Look, I'm pretty new to skincare routines, but I'm trying, okay? I'm trying to get rid of these bags under my eyes. I'm trying to sleep and drink water, all that jazz. 
Back in the 18th century, those bags under your eyes were a lot harder to get rid of. Lead mixed with vinegar, this would make you look more pale. If I used this, I would literally be a ghost. I would just be invisible. I would, you would just hear a voice in a green screen right now. In the 18th century, that pale look was ideal, but this lead vinegar mix also smoothed out your face. So, what could go wrong, right? Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and arsenic. Those powerful three things you don't want anywhere near your face. Yeah, arsenic too, the same deadly poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. Just the worst ingredients in the 1800s cosmetics game, really. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has arsenic on its priority list of hazardous substances. Toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing today in this century, so I hope this is eye-opening. Sans poison eye drops, I hope it's eye-opening. And finally, coming in at number one, deodorant. What did people even do before Old Spice? You know, before that guy was born, how did we know how to smell good? What did we know how to do? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s, and it was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide, and it was stored in metal cold containers. That's just not nothing like speed stick at all. It's not discreet in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't long until the first antiperspirant came along right after it. It was called Everdry, and it was always damp, ironically, and it would always burn your underarms. It literally would eat through your clothes. I think at that point, I'd rather smell bad. Like, let me have rashes, let my face look horrible, let the bags show. I don't, I'd rather do all that than any of this. This is horrible. Number 10, chill pans. These ancient slippers-ish shoes were used for more than just throwing at the heads of your unruly teenagers. Imagine catching a hardwood 14-inch Chopin across your butt, throwing at you like a 90-mile fastball. Solid wood, too. Just a huge block, just <laughs> Originally worn and seen on the women in the 15th, and 16th, and 17th century Italy and France, these huge platform heels were designed for sliding over your shoes and socks to keep them dry and clean from the mud and the muck. Rule of thumb was, hire the Chopin, hire the class. Most of the time, these platform shoes are so high that you would need an assistant just to help you get around. Yeah. No, I don't. I want to go this way, please. Thank you. Walking all over the place like Gene Simmons, 14 feet high. Great way to roll your ankle. Sometimes embroidered or lined with gems and jewels, these shoes were purely decorative and pretty impractical, as you can, as you can see. No one's walking up a spiral staircase in those things. No thanks. Number nine, head cones. Egyptologists have decoded the 14th century BCE paintings about these mysterious caps worn on the heads of certain women in ancient Egypt. First assumed it was of religious or ceremonial wear and tear, researchers and archaeologists think that they've cracked the code finally. It's actually a big wad of sticky beeswax. Yeah, but it smells nice. A perfume. This ball of specific gunk sat under the cap, sitting on the crown of the head that under the sun, over the course of the day, would cleanse the body with pleasant smells. Mostly stuffed with either beeswax or animal fat, and then packed with your favorite pleasant smelling herbs and flowers. The cap would then slowly melt on top of your head and would just drip down into the hair and down the body all day, slowly releasing a cologne shampoo hybrid sort of thing. Some were even stuffed with essential oils for the skin. And it wasn't just putting in fennel on your head at the end of the day, huh? That's nice. As of now, researchers have only been able to find women wearing these deodorant hats and paintings and carvings, and have yet to find a man wearing these ancient eau de toilettes. Ah uh, yes, the scent of a man. Ladies, look over here. And now here. I smell disgusting. Number eight, chatelaines. These practical and very decorative accessories have been used since the 18th and 19th centuries. A deadly yet decorative fashion ending in the Victorian era. Typically a chain made of metal, usually silver, bronze or brass, and hung from the waistband, riddled with tools and trinkets, attached to it for your everyday use. Cobblers would have cobbler stuff, dentists would have dentist stuff. Basically this was just a cool belt chain on your jeans like a giant multi-tool on a keychain. Everything from vials with smelling salts, whistles, to even knives and protective devices. Just a giant set of janitor keys with different tools on it. I feel like this definitely gave way to the Swiss Army knife. Uh, Flathead or Robinson. Oh, I got a Phillips if you need. A Phillips? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It was mobile, decorative, and personal. I'm surprised we don't have these right now. I mean, I would use it. Mine would have like 11 chapsticks on it, just all in a row, you know? Number seven, cloaks. These mobile sleeping bags have been worn as far back as ancient Greece and ancient Mesopotamia. Made out of anything from fur to wool, these usually neck to foot length portable blankets were seen as both practical and decorative. 
one of the most used and reused clothing technologies. I can understand why such a simple piece of material can be used for so many different things. Protect you from most elements, camouflage you when hiding, and you could pretty much make these yourselves. Some people added hoods and pockets to theirs. Harry Potter gets it, Batman gets it. These people got it. Cloaks, capes, magicians' uniforms, we still use these things to this day. We gotta bring these back with youngins, just Dracula cape someone on an exit. I mean, that's like the new mic drop. Yeah, I'll see you this weekend. Number six. Togas, much like the cloak, a very simple and ageless garment. A loose fitting sheet typically wrapped and folded across a person's body, seen as far back and popularized by ancient Romans. These common eggshell white dresses were used as general garb by both men and women of all classes. Think about how much red wine they would spill on these. Apparently they were big drinkers back then. Uh, sorry, do you have any club soda? Yeah, just, just don't dab it, please. Just blot it. Thank you. <laughs> and these things were huge too. You almost always needed help wrapping yourself up like a burrito. <sighs> Hurry up. Usually young boys would wear purple until they were a man. If you were mourning, then you would wear dark colors. And if you were in state, you would have the typical white toga, possibly with some colorful embroidery for some class. Pretty easy, you have like three choices. No more throwing clothes on and on before school. No, not that, I wore that last week. Can I see the white again? This garment was eventually abandoned by women and then the lower class and then the upper class and then eventually men just really wore them at frat parties. Toga, toga, yo, Raven Romulus, bro, you're nuts, man. Number five in the countdown is all about buggy dresses. The wealthy Victorians were very into the grandeur, looking to feed a fascination with culture, especially. Beetle wing embroidery was at a peak of fame in the 18th century India and was quickly appropriated by English visitors while military occupied the country from 1858 to 1947. Elytra, which is the hard casing over a beetle's wing, first appeared on dresses and experienced their first burst of popularity in England by the 1820s. Though English women in India had likely been donning it since at least the 1780s. Material used was often white or other pale colors to help augment the reflective green tones of the beetle wing. This visual was made possible when Elytra was paired with Zardozzi, a gold embroidery style often done on colored cottons or silks. Victorians at least didn't appropriate everything about the art form. They made patterns and styles of their own for the dresses. Elytra was sewn onto the gowns in an imitation of live beetle patterns, a reflection of Victorian interest in naturalism and zoology. Not sure why anyone wants to look like they have live bugs crawling on them, but okay. Number four is the casual ball gown. One of the most notable shifts in Victorian time was that fashion began to be differentiated by gender rather than class. This reflected the changing roles of women in society. And let me say, every part of Victorian women's fashion seems tortuous. You start your day layering on long crotchless underwear and tunics before strapping a metal cage to your waist. You then wear an average of six skirts over that, along alongside bodices and corsets that would forever change the placement of your organs and potentially even suffocate you to death. The reported average weight of a Victorian dress when fully on could be anywhere between 14 and 22 pounds. But the risk doesn't end there. In fact, it was everywhere. It was estimated that between the 1850s and 1860s, 3,000 women in England died from their crinolines catching fire, as airy fabrics and hoop-supported skirts also allowed for plenty of air to circulate beneath a dress, which could also make a small flame grow out of control in seconds. In 1864, the New York Times reported that 40,000 women worldwide perished from dress-related fires. Another common occurrence was to see them pulled into machinery after walking too close and having some of the skirts catch in exposed parts. Yikes. It's no wonder that the large ball gown crinolines phased out in the late 1800s, but then bustles came in and they were worse in different ways. While more practical as it was slim on the sides and the front, it required women to sacrifice movement and comfort in order to achieve a fashionable shape like the corset did. They began to alter women's spines, ribs, and organs over time as they required women to twist their bodies completely in order to be able to sit down. Overall, while movies and TV may make these beautiful gowns seem whimsical and ethereal, they truly were just death traps. Number three in the countdown is bird-brained. I enjoy my puns, but there's a reason for that one. This trend was started by the notorious Marie Antoinette, a rebel in the French courts for her outlandish fashion and accessories. Amongst her pile of powdered curls,
girls, Marie was often seen with feathered caps and bonnets. While this look became an envy for women across America and Europe, the trend did struggle to take off initially as much of the aristocracy was perturbed by it. However, a trend is a trend, and eventually the English society was persuaded. They donned mainly ostrich, pheasant, or peacock feathers at first. Eventually, entire songbirds were stuffed after their death and adorned these hats. By the late 1800s, the plume trade had decimated several species of birds, including flamingos, birds of paradise, and rosy spoonbirds. Topping the endangered list were the snowy and great egrets, as at one point their pure white feathers were worth more than gold. Promoters of the feather trade knew what they were doing and also knew that the public didn't understand the carnage that their fashion was sieging on these animals. They held that wearing feathers and whole birds brought city dwellers closer to nature, that it improved people's awareness and knowledge of bird species. Thankfully, it's due to the inevitable public awareness and then disapproval that bird hat sales diminished and went out of trend altogether. Number two slot in the countdown is Paris Green. It seemed Parisian aristocracy had a chokehold on the globe with their trends. It's believed Empress Eugenie was to have worn a dress so stunning at the Paris Opera one evening in 1864 that it was featured in newspapers globally the next day. It was a deep yet vibrant green, one rumored to almost glow in darkness. The green of Paris quickly became the hue of the social elite. So how was Paris green made and why was it so dangerous? The color was discovered when chemists combined copper and arsenic poison. The result was a dye brighter than all the other greens available on the market. Copper wasn't what gave this color its iconic nickname however. Arsenic is a highly hazardous substance that causes skin sores, vomiting, diarrhea, and in some circumstances cancers or death, as we know now. But they didn't. When factory workers' arms and hands began to wilt away from sores and decay that could only be connected to the dye, French and German governments enacted legislation prohibiting the production of arsenic-based pigments. It's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, the British government mainly ignored them. Even when Matilda Schreuer famously died of arsenic poisoning with the whites of her eyes stained green from her working in factories. This was deemed accidental poisoning by the government at the time. Paris green remained popular in England until ironically it just went out of trend. It's a little bit of an abrupt ending honestly. No justice for those exposed in workplaces or compensation for suffering. But nothing takes the cake quite like the Victorian trend of looking dead, which is number one in our countdown. You'd figure people look dead enough as is inhaling arsenic and mercury from their clothes and shoes and hats constantly, let alone their home decor. But looking dead was the fashion of the day. This look was specifically modeled after how tuberculosis affected you. Pale skin, watery eyes, red lips. While this disease was decimating the lower status, higher status women recreated it with makeup and arsenic consumption. You heard me right. In order to get pale skin, women consumed arsenic. In order to not die from arsenic, the consumer had to follow a careful process, eating small doses to build up a tolerance. Now, arsenic is addictive, so if they at any point stopped the consumption, they would experience withdrawals such as vomiting, stomach pains, convulsions, hair loss, nervous system failure, kidney failure, delusions, the list goes on. Some women were stuck taking it for the rest of their lives. For the desired watery eye look, women would put citrus or even perfume in their eyes. Some went farther, using belladonna flower, also known as deadly nightshade, for longer lasting tears. However being poisonous, little wonder why blindness was a widely reported as a symptom of belladonna drops. No wonder it did such a good job. Red lip paint included? You guessed it, more poison. In this case, usually lead. All of these poisonous products would contribute to illnesses and facial decay. Death was of course a long term side effect of the usage once poisoning reached its crescendo. Suffice to say, while you may really want to fit in, some trends are not worth getting on board for, especially if they'll slowly melt your face off. It's on your list off at number 10, no bar stools. This one here is for all the bartenders out there. Okay, bar seating is vital when you go out. It's the first thing that you see when your random party of 12 arrives and then asks for spots all of a sudden. So it's a little jarring to imagine a world where you couldn't sit down at a local pub. Yeah, standing room only. That's it, don't lock those knees or get too comfortable. You get your regulars coming in often, right? You got Karen with the limp, she's so nice, she's awesome. Imagine if she had to stand up the entire time. No way, get out of here. We have a booth just for her all the time. She always gets a grilled cheese, so nice. Back in the Western days, bar stools weren't a thing. In the 1800s, you couldn't sit and vent to your local barkeep about why your ex hasn't texted you back. No, that wasn't a thing. They didn't have stools at the bar, nothing, just one rail. Just a bar rail to put your foot on and then have a weird 
balanced the whole time. That's great, that's awesome. I feel like a cowboy already. Just a nice cowboy lean, that's comfortable. I'll eat fish and chips standing up, I guess. Let's move on. Number nine, medicinal showmen. Back in the Wild West, I mean from the 1860s, from the 1890s really, they had these medicinal showmen. And it's exactly what you think, it's ridiculous. Step right up, you won't believe your eyes. Cough syrup. Crazy, right? So these guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, but they would really nail the pitch. I mean, that's all they had back then. There's no science to back them up. There's no Yelp reviews. They would have pawns instead, like their friends, run ahead into town and plant themselves in the audience before these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman, doctor arrives, whatever, he randomly picks an ill patient and then boom, just like that, they would be cured. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made by John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, root, and animal fat. It was said to treat any illness, but in reality, it was only a laxative. What a fun show that is. Step right up. Not, not that close. Trust me, not that close. Number eight, camels? That's right, we're not riding horses, we're riding camels. We got room for two people, depending on the amount of humps. I know they have one or two, depending on which, all right. In 1855, the United States Army decided to import 75 camels into Texas. Yeah, why not? After all, the train in the Old West was fairly similar to the Middle East, so I guess it made sense. The camels made supply runs between Camp Verde and San Antonio, but trouble began when an American Civil War broke out. Yeah, a little bit of a thing happened there. Now eventually the camels were sold off or simply let go into the wild where they multiplied and began to cause havoc and then so on and so forth. So much so that folks began to spin urban legends such as the red ghost, which was a 30 foot tall creature that made people quiver in their you know, britches or britches. I don't know what they say, jeans or pants? Whatever's Western, the Western version of pants. Trousers, that's British. Trousers is definitely British. It's not a cowboy at all. When in reality, it wasn't a monster, it was just a camel. But yeah, camels can be pretty frightening when you see just a silhouette. Again, with the two humps, it looks like a monster, for sure. I was a kid, I went on a camel ride once and I cried. Never doing that again. Also, that's pretty cruel. I'm not riding a camel. Number seven, going the distance. First things first, how much was an IPA back in the 1800s, right? What's this gonna cost? Some beers today are wild. I live downtown Toronto, it's crazy. Every bar I go into, it's insane. It's like $13 to get an IPA. It's like Gary's Rootin' Tootin' IPA. A pint made in-house with this bare feet. Tastes like a cup of nickels. Not a fan, not a fan of the IPA game. Today we have happy hour specials, wine pairing suggestions to go along with your meal, a lovely wine sommelier to aggressively tell you which bottle to get. But back in the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel just to get them. Yeah, what a weird system, right? In the Yukon, for example, their shots of whiskey were 50 cents a pop. Now, that was a lot back in the day. So if you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in Colorado, well, it'd be a lot different, it'd be a lot cheaper. If you kick the saloon doors open and you're out of breath, well, it's very clear that you've traveled a long way. Hey, this guy's out of breath. Let's charge him double for all of his troubles. Why not? Let's go, get off the floor. So out of breath, he's like, give me some water. How do they kick open saloon doors? They would just swing right back. They're not ideal doors to kick open. Number six. Missing mines. There's billions of dollars worth of gold just lost at the bottom of the ocean. That's fun, it's out there right now, waiting for you to go and get it. Right after you click that thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Right after you do those things, go and find that gold for us. But if swimming isn't your thing, eh, no problem. Try the West, plenty of gold out there. There's dozens of lost treasure troves just hidden in mines, like the San Saba gold mine, for example, or the wheelbarrow mine, for example, or more that I'm not gonna name because well, maybe I'll go check them out myself. I don't know. None compare to the Dutchman mine. That one is very special. Now, this legend has it that a man named Jacob Waltz, a German prospector, he found the richest gold mine in the world. Now, that's what he told his friends. And would we ever lie to our friends about gold? No, never, okay? I certainly wouldn't. It's definitely real, man, for sure. First gold rush was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this big, shiny, yellow rock. He had no idea what it was. And for years, he and his father, John Reed, used it as a door stopper. Yeah, the 17 pound nugget of gold. He just grabbed it, threw it on the floor, and then held his door open all day. Hey, come on in, here's company. Watch your foot over that big stupid rock. Back then, this information was game changing. Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina. Cause yeah, people started to catch on how much it was worth. Put that in my pocket, thanks. Number five, smoke break jackets. Here we go. Hey, remember Hugh Hefner? Yeah, not only did he treat women like but he also dressed like it completely. Yeah, 
rather fitting if you ask me. Guy would wear a stinky maroon colored jacket and then sit there and blow smoke in your face all night. What an icon, guy changed history. He would wear what's called a smoking jacket. That's what he was, that's what this garbage is. They were around in the 1600s, but they really peaked popularity in the 1920s when he was like 56 years old, you know what I mean? These jackets were designed for gentlemen. I mean, obviously, you know. You know, they were designed as bathrobes with class. They were made of this velvet cloth, perfect for soaking up cigar smoke and further accusations. God rest his soul. He really left his mark in history, didn't he? Number four, corsets. Okay, we know literally everything about these things, but you don't, so listen up. If you have to put your foot in the middle of my back to lace me up, yeah, it's too tight. Or is it? A stiff and rigid piece of clothing that I could definitely use for my posture. The corset, first invented in Italy, then France, then England. The rigid posture and protective garment around the kidneys, ribs, and vital organs under a knight's armor were adopted for style, class, and shape. Most popularized during the 16th century, this slim and sleek look was adored and worn by all classes. The best way for a woman to shape her bust? A man's chest straight and high while riding. And a great way to lose consciousness. No, 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 I can breathe gold, gold and tighter. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Usually made out of something strong like whalebone or wood. The stitched corsets would maintain its hard shape and the wearer would basically just be stitched in for the entirety of the day. That sounds comfortable. Number three, hammer pants. Okay, look, Kyle and I were on a dance team or two growing up, we get it. Baggy pants, extra zippers, zippers that don't even have pockets, pockets that are far too shallow to hold even that of a chapstick. We get it, okay? We love a good pair of dance pants. The hammer pants from the 90s, I don't think that was it. We should have heeded MC Hammer's warning and not touched it, you know what I mean? The man turned 60 this year, so we have to now look back on the truth from him. MC Hammer himself has made it very clear. He says, quote, don't call them parachute pants. I detest the term, end quote. Yeah, man of few words, but you know what? When you sing that many songs, you don't need to speak anymore. Obviously, MC Hammer didn't invent this style, but it's funny to see him act like he did, you know what I mean? These types of trousers initially appeared in Persia, India, and Turkey thousands of years ago, but we love your bangers, MC Hammer. All three. Number two, Belladonna Drops. Growing up with bad vision, I've had some pretty weird things shoved into my eyes. Dirty fingers, drops, but never a scoop of berry jam. Nah, I kind of missed out on that one, I guess. Okay, maybe not jam, but the Belladonna Berries, though very toxic, had an unusual role in beauty standards in medieval Europe. Upon squishing this doughy-eyed remedy into your sockets, the persons, usually women's eyes, would dilate, resulting in huge, doughy puppy dog eyes, just running around town with blurred vision like you're about to get ophthalmologisted. E, M, L, four, nine, strawberry, raspberry, blueberry, that's not, okay, what, what? Of course, you wouldn't be able to see how good you look, per se, as if you've ever been dilated for optometrist reasons, then you know exactly what I mean. The belladonna or beautiful woman drops got you running into walls every two seconds, but boy oh boy does she look beautiful. Number one, paper dresses. This short-lived fad was introduced in the 1960s. It was a good one, it was exactly what you think. Paper dresses, nice, paper Mario in real life. Finally, I've always wanted this. I can already feel the paper cuts. Ah, what a nightmare this ought to be, here we go. Paper dresses to go, go. That was the phrase they like to use. They said the word go twice, therefore must be a good product. The Scott Paper Company made these not expecting the reaction that it got. It caught on quickly, of course. It only took six months for this casual paper company to start selling more than half a million paper dresses. Just out of nowhere, they're like, oh, let's just try this, and then it worked. It went so well that other companies hopped on board, just like the propeller hats. Over $3 million were spent on this awful fad. Andy Warhol was even in on the mix. It was a big deal. Everybody wanted to be involved. They weren't made of flimsy printer paper. It wasn't as bad as I'm making it sound, but it certainly wasn't great either. The dress was made of disposable material called DuraWeave. You know, before it was cool to make things out of disposable materials. Believe it or not, it was slightly water and slightly fire resistant. Unlike those puffy middle-aged dresses that immediately go woom and then they don't exist anymore. This one was a little bit better. It was took the flame a little bit of time, right? It's been compared to the thick paper bib that you get at the dentist. Yeah, you know that horrible material that bunches up and pokes your neck mid-root canal while Kyle's doing stuff? It's made of that. 
fun. We love history. We love beautiful fashion history. And number 10, leather jackets. I just had to say that cool. I felt like I needed to. Okay, so how did we get from prehistoric leather to grease lightning? This warm, durable piece of clothing has been popular for many eras, but now, where did it all start? Well, firstly, on the animal. The leather jacket we're used to seeing is based off the World War I jackets. That's right, German pilots wore these brown, thick leather jackets in their planes before the cooler, sleeker bomber jacket was born. From the early 1900s, we see the leather jacket really start to take off with more military use in World War II, now worn by all sides. Irvin Schott's initial design was created in 1928 and widely used by military motorcycle personnel. He named the first one the Perfecto after his favorite cigar company. It wasn't until the 1950s and 60s where we see this garment take on a sense of actual fashion with studs like McQueen and Brando repping the look in Hollywood movies and well, there it took off. Punks in the 70s and 80s, women, men, these are all everywhere now. Of course, the faux leather has also made its way into life now with the abuse and cruelty of animals. I'm all here for it, not judging. And it comes in literally every size and color and you can literally buy a leather jacket anywhere you go. Number nine, Lash Lure. Turning the calendars back to 1933, the year FM radios and drive-in movie theaters changed the world as we know it. Right on, I love both of those things, still, so much, for sure. See, not all inventions in 1933 were family friendly. Some of them were quite deadly. Like the one of a kind mascara, Lash Lure. Here we go, it'll lure you right in, easy peasy. This 1930s cosmetic contained a chemical called p phenylidamine I can't even say it, that's how you know it's bad, right? This mascara left blisters all over your face. It wasn't working, the chemicals didn't react properly for some cases, and it was horrible. Now, eventually, in 1933, there was sadly a death. One woman sadly developed an infection, a bacterial infection, and ultimately passed away because of said mascara. That same year, the before and after photos were used in an FDA display titled The Chamber of Horrors. Yeah, it was a horrible incident, but it got the attention from higher ups. Lash Lure was the first product in history that was ever removed from stores. There's a little dark fun fact for you. I guess the display at the old Chamber of Horrors did the trick. Lord. We're in the middle of something similar now though, aren't we? Cigarette packages have those horrible side effects to smoking images right there on the package, you know? The chick on the cover looks like a demigorgon from Stranger Things. You're like, Ugh, I'm all set. I'm just gonna fidget spin this. That's horrible. Number eight, sunglasses. This bright invention was first created in the 12th century China. This rough, heavy slab of carved quartz was first used in an attempt to block the sun's powerful rays while being able to protect the face and eyes. These glasses didn't have ear rods and were just held up against the face. The Inuit of North Canada have something like this as well, made out of bone or a piece of wood, carved with slits cut out of it for the eyes to see into the bright snow. The smoky glass texture of the quartz allowed the person to see through the glasses and have the rays refracted through the dark color. See, I said refracted, lots of scientific words, you know what I mean? Basically, they were just experimenting with different smoky rocks and gems in front of their face until James Oskow started making way with tinted lenses in the 18th century. The rich were wearing more and more shades until about 1939 when Ray-Ban made the aviator polarized lenses and the shades were forever changed. First pair sold for five bucks. 40 days to carve and polish for five bucks, huh? It's not a bad deal. Number seven, big foreheads. Here we go, this one's for the ladies. Nice, hit that thumbs up for this big old forehead, this bright forehead. You can see the lights off. If I stand here, that's the forehead light right here. Elizabethan foreheads, yes. Here's one I can finally lean into. My family called me a five head growing up. Little did they know I would have cleaned up shop back in the 1600s. Here we go, plucking your hairline was a sign of beauty back in the day. How? Amazing is that. I mean, it still is today, but it's different, right? We're kind of pulling back. We're like, you know what? No, I don't want to pluck anything anymore. It hurts, I'm done. More often than not, women in the Renaissance era wore restrictive upper body clothing. The ideal look back then was flat chested and hair plucked back, like you're a goddamn chicken. I can't even pluck this unibrow thing that I have going on here. I just shave it, I give up. Plucking hurts. I'm just gonna shave this one spot for the rest of my life. So mad respect to the pluckers out there. Pain is beauty, I guess. Ice road pluckers. Number six, cowboy hats. Well, howdy, partner. <laughs> Made most popular by horse riders, farmers, and your buddy named Dougie, the cowboy hat or cavalry hat has been around for quite a long time. First started with the Mongolian riders and then taken on new shapes and forms throughout history as the wide brimmed hat. The cowboy hat is back and popularized in southern states around the early 1800s. Made out of literally any material from straw to felt, this large crown, large brimmed hat kept the sun out of your face and off your body. Hey, sun safety. It resembles the sombrero from the early Mexican use 
use and influence. These things have been around for centuries and are still thriving. I mean, just go to any Kenny Chesney concert, you'll find about 100 on the ground after the concert. Just pick one up, put it on your head, free. Some have strings, some have feathers. The cowboy hat has made its place in fashion and practically yeehaw on forever. That's a terrible joke. Number five, corsets. Nobody wants a waist bigger than nine inches, said everybody in Victorian times. I, for one, can appreciate the female form and the hourglass figure. It's admirable, sure, but that being said, I, I don't think we need to go so far to keep the female form in shape. The corset's a little too much. Corsets were those chest tightening, gut sunking, push all to mince meat to the top of the pie, apparel that went under every woman's dress or every fat dude in his 50s who wants to feel 29 again. I don't think I have to tell you why this is bad or uncomfortable. The human chest needs to breathe, and when something's that tight around you, well, you struggle to breathe. Uh, trouble breathing, fainting were not all too rare, especially in hot and humid climates. For my generation, you may recall Elizabeth Swan had issue with hers in Pirates of the Caribbean. And then she fell, and then Jack Sparrow caught her, and it was a good movie. But don't, the corsets, I just, I can't get behind them. Number four, foot binding. While not exclusively done in the Victorian era, it was started in ancient times and continued all the way up until the 20th century, thus includes the Victorian era. A Chinese fashion tradition that takes women's feet and binds them and squeezes them until they begin to change shape. Oh, poor ladies. Again, I don't think I need to tell you that forcibly changing bone and muscle structure in your feet just for fashion is a bad idea. I think you all know that. For starters, it doesn't look right. After years of binding, the shape of the foot drastically changes. Secondly, the health risk of doing such is not worth it. Oftentimes, toenails fall off or become infected. Ugh, gross. Bones break and pierce skin. It's a bad time all around. Thank God we stopped doing that, right? Jeez. Oh, thanks. Number three, lard wigs. Wigs have been around for a long time. If you're a fancy politician from Washington, you wear a powdered wig, singing Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to the Capitol building. Balding men, women, or really anyone can wear a wig. It's, it's really for everyone. What I'm getting at is it's been around for a long time and we've come a long way. Given enough time and asked to tell the difference, I probably couldn't. I, I, really, I really couldn't point out a wig if, if you showed me. So we're getting really good at it these days. That being said, in the Victorian times, wigs were quite common and were fashioned with a peculiar substance. Lard, yes. Imagine every day of the week without proper baths or showers and living in close proximity to the Thames River. And you take a handful of pig lard and just slather that in your wig to style it. Put a gross sound effect in there, just gross sound, ugh. Do you imagine the smell? This is the most offensive hair crime since frosted tips in the early 2000s. Those were a big mistake too, I gotta say. Not, I had them, but it was. there's only one man who can pull that off. And he's in Flavortown, you know who I'm talking about. Number two, German helmets. 1914 was the end of the Victorian era and the beginning of the modern era. It's actually a very fascinating time. It's kind of like modern meeting the past, really cool. Well, fashion just doesn't mean civilian. Anyone who's ever spent time in the Marine Corps knows that they gotta look their best. Wow, Marines. The Empire of Germany was no different in 1914, and a lot of German soldiers wore helmets with an ornamental spike, like a Koopa from Super Mario. I know you guys have seen the movies, you, you, you've seen them. Except the main issue here wasn't an overweight Italian plumber jumping on their heads, uh, but the war and the enemy itself. World War I was fought in a lot of trenches, so it's kind of awkward when you can see a bunch of little spikes moving up and around the enemy's trench. It's also kind of dangerous to have an extra piece on your helmet as you can get caught in weird places like barbed wire. And yes, if you're wondering, sometimes they were used in the absence of a good melee tool. Yeah, you'd be correct, sometimes they did. You gotta do what you gotta do. Oh, brutal. Number one, French uniforms. More World War I, but it's still Victorian. It counts, I promise. While the spiked helmets were a very bad idea, they were shortly phased out. They learned their lesson. However, the French stood up and said, no, 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 I have a worse idea. Also, shout out to France. You guys get a bad rap for the war, but it's really your war. You guys rock the man. You guys are the best, love France. Anyway, the French uniforms were a little bit of a mistake. In a classic case of fashion over function, kind of the theme of this list, they wore very bright and blue red uniforms. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but bright blue doesn't exactly blend into an environment. Thus, it made French soldiers a very easy target. Everything's like gray, black, and brown, and you're just wearing bright blue and red pants. Yeah, you're gonna, you're not gonna make it far, Chief. 